Welcome to the West Hearts College podcast series, The Industry in Isolation. Each week we'll be speaking to various professionals across the creative industries to answer student questions and to find out what the secret is to their success. Hi Tom. Hey. How's it going? Yeah, good. Just, you enjoying uh, lockdown? Yeah. So we'll just jump straight in then. How did you become interested in production arts and sound design? Uh, so I have always been a guitarist since I was like 10. I started playing guitar and got to sixth form and I studied music performance and PE. Those are kind of my two topics I ended up doing. Um, and I kind of got into, yeah, so I was playing lots of bands and stuff and I decided to go to uni and study uh, music production. Uh, so I went to the University of Huddersfield, so up in Yorkshire. The course was uh, BA Popular Music Production um, and that was a sandwich course. So it was three years of learning and a placement year in between second and final year. And did you find that that placement year helped you um, to kind of develop skills and things like that? Yeah, definitely. I, that, I'd recommend it to a, anyone that does a uni degree. Um, it's great. Just get to use your everything you've learned um, in the workplace. And then also you see the standard that people are doing what you've been studying and the standard you need to be at to be in a competitive field. So, yeah, definitely recommend it to everyone. And was that standard drastically different from what you were used to at uni or, or was it just an extension of what you'd already been taught? Um, it was it was the little things. So it was more little things like um, file management and being organised and efficient. Because um, obviously when you're working in the actual industry, you don't have as much time to do complete jobs and stuff like that. So you need to get things right the first time and... Uh, make sure things are backed up and saved so you don't lose clients' work and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, uh, it was, trying to think of the best. it was kind of a bit of a step up to begin with, but then you learn the basics and stuff at uni and then you just build on those. That's great. Okay, so what was the interview process for getting into Huddersfield? That's quite a, a big university for, for music production and practice. Yeah, there's lots of there's a lot of different courses. Uh, I can't remember if I had an interview. No, I don't think I did. I went for I went to the open days because um, I had like a heap of different courses. I was originally supposed to be going to the Barnsley campus, mm. but then I, I saw it and it was a, it was a lot smaller, and you'd be living in Barnsley as opposed to Huddersfield, so it was a lot smaller nightlife and everything in general. And I was like, oh, I'd prefer to go to a bigger town. Um, so then I went over to the main campus and saw what courses they had and they had yeah a lot more and the course that I picked was more suited to me so um, yeah so I ended up going there but I, can't, I don't think I did had an interview I think it was the I can't even remember how you do it with UCAS you get you apply it's just the point system that you got yeah, you apply and I think it was I had the, I was going to get the points or due to or whatever so Oh, well, then you got through very lucky then. No audition, nothing. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what did you study curriculum-wise on that course then? Uh, so it was quite a broad course, and that was kind of why I picked it, because I wanted to learn about all different elements within being a sound engineer um, to then decide further down the line what I'd want to do. So it had uh, recording modules, um, sound for film and TV, um, performance, technical stuff. Um, so like soldering and wiring and stuff like that. That was all first year radio production, um, computer composition, live sound. It was literally like every business in the industry. Um, so yeah, it was just broad spectrum really and then I whittled it down as I went through the years to specialise a bit more. And what kind of prompted you to specialise um, 
in theatre then or did you specialise in theatre at the beginning? I, I didn't actually I was going down so I did my placement year uh, I wanted to do studio recording be a studio engineer um, but I got a placement uh, in a post-production studio in London um, but they did uh, stuff for TV and film and, and radio um, mainly radio stuff uh, so after doing that and seeing what was involved in that sort uh, side of the industry, um, I then went and did my dissertation more on film sound and I was trying to do uh, dialogue replacements, ADR. So like um, when you record on location and the dialogue isn't recorded very well or you, there's been reasons as to why it doesn't sound good, you then go and yeah. record it in a studio and then mix it back in and make it sound as if it was recorded in the original source. Um, so yeah, I did my dissertation on that and then a job in theatre came up um, and then ended up going on tour. So I kind of jumped straight out of post-production and went into theatre. So it wasn't, uh, I didn't specialise in it. I did a module in live sound, um, but yeah, I was more leaning towards the post-production side. And then, yeah, things just came up and changed. <laughs> That's kind of cool, though. You kind of had all the options open. You're able to kind of go any way you wanted. Yeah. And what would be the best piece of advice you could give someone who is training in sound design and sound engineering um, about those steps? You know, if you could go back and give yourself some advice, what would that be? Uh, well, if, if you're not sure what kind of route you want to go down, pick a course that is broad and does all the different elements because there's, there's going to be transferable skills between different parts of the industry for sure I mean that's how I jumped from post to theatre because if you, you know the basics and you have a good ear you can hear these things and it works whatever part of the industry you're in um, so yeah pick a broad subject if you're not sure and if you are sure study and work hard um, and opportunities will come up. Thanks that's, that's really good that's a great answer there. Let's talk about kind of getting work then so how do you get work as a freelance sound engineer? What's kind of the process? It can be quite difficult. Um, I got lucky in that I fell into work straight out of uni because I know a lot of people didn't and not many of my friends or colleagues from uni didn't or actually are working as sound engineers now. They're doing different elements or completely different stuff. But a large chunk of my work comes through word of mouth now that I've got jobs, which is easy enough to say now but if I was going into the industry it's quite hard so going in people always recommend work, uh, trying to get jobs in warehouses for production companies and hire companies because uh, from there so that's where all shows are prepped and you get all the kit and set up and stuff um, so if you can get a job in there then that's a good way of learning how things are going to be set up for shows and stuff like that in the live scene and then if you're good and reliable and stuff like that, and people normally get picked up and taken out through that on tours and stuff. Um, but yeah, the main chunk of my work is through word of mouth. Uh, I'm part of a Facebook group. There's a couple live sound engineer Facebook groups and stuff, um, which are very useful for people who advertise jobs quite a lot, surprisingly, actually. Um, not at the moment, but previously did. Yes, yeah, so that's another good source mainly is word of mouth and previous employment wow so that, that's quite a an independent thing that you've got to do. you've got to really kind of push yourself forward especially if it is word of mouth you mentioned facebook being quite a good place to pick up work in in that regard i know that that's true for a lot of people um who i've spoken to who, who are able to kind of get work that way are there any other platforms that you use or you'd recommend or is it strictly kind of just facebook and word of mouth yeah mainly because these are they're like private groups and people who are often looking for staff will advertise on these groups because they know they're getting people that are in this industry um so those uh haven't really used any other i can't think of any others mandy is another one but i i haven't used it myself for a job people have said oh there's this job and sent me stuff i haven't actually got a job to it myself but that's a good source because they advertise uh it's been yeah most of the roles that would be on facebook and, and man and stuff they jump between the two um yeah nice okay um 
it's yeah it's quite good actually so they're kind of confined to just two places it's a lot easier to kind of navigate i guess yeah so if you get a response for a job do you have to interview for it then or or is it kind of as you say word of mouth they just take you on based on the re- on the review you've been given most of the time you'd be interviewed a phone call but um again a lot of it is if you have mutual friends and stuff like that a lot of the time people would have inquired about you that you know someone that they do and stuff like that you often get people say oh what's this person like and stuff like that um because it is quite a especially in theatre it's a small industry so yeah you know a lot a large chunk of the people so then uh when it comes to kind of doing interviews in within that kind of having those phone calls um what's kind of the protocol with them is are they quite um formal or just informal chats most of the ones I've done have been quite informal. Uh, I mean, if so, if I, I do a lot of touring theatre jobs, so the skill set and stuff needed in that is very much the same tour to tour. You've got the same principles. It just depends. You have particular things for each, for each show. Um, but, yeah, it would more be questions of, are we, you know, are you going to be able to handle this, this, this with the job? You know, it's going to be this amount of people on it. There's going to be this much stuff that he's doing and hours and stuff like that. But it's, it's more just making sure that you'd be capable of the job. If you, with most of the tours, you know, if you've done a certain scale size, then it's similar tour to tour. Also, that kind of makes it a little bit easier for you, I guess. Yeah. Um, so... How do you maintain yourself between um, sound jobs? Do you kind of do any other kind of freelance work or is it primarily just kind of waiting for that next job to come? Uh, it depends. Really. I've, I've been quite lucky because um, I've had my mostly back-to-back jobs um, since uni. So I've gone off and done three-month tours or whatever and then come back and or, or set up one to go straight on to. Um, so I've... I, most of the time I've tried to do it so I'll tour for a chunk of time and then have a week or two off just to go home reset you know sort my life out a bit um and then hit go back on the road again um and then it just kind of stuff like holiday and living life and stuff you kind of just fit in the gaps um which has worked so far well it's nice to know that you can get a little bit of a break in between as well isn't it yeah yeah (laughs) okay so talk me through what happens once you get the job um what happens from the moment you say yeah I'm definitely on board and they say okay cool you've you've got the job on this tour to the beginning of the show what's kind of your role in that that time period so it depends on what specific role I'm doing so most of my jobs so far I've been a sound number two um which is like the backstage uh member of the sound department who will look after cast mics the band or whatever it is for that particular show. Um, and then I've done some jobs as number one or head of sound, um, so that's mixing the show. So if I f- was doing a job as a number two, from saying yes to doing the job, I'd then be going to prep the show, uh, which would be during the rehearsal period for the actors, or it's n- normally about the week before, week or two weeks before the show is going into a venue. Um, so you'll go to a higher um company whoever's hiring the sound kit for the tour um and you will build all the sound racks um make all the looms basically build this infrastructure for the show and make sure it all works and tested and everything before it then goes out on the road so you've basically got a full system all the pa everything working before you leave the warehouse so then when you get to the venue you know that all your kit is ready and then you set it up for the show uh so yeah you do that and then you do the load in for the show that can take however long depends on the size of it um most shows are two-day fit-ups it just depends on what you're doing if you're putting a show into a venue for an extended period of time it would take a bit longer because you would do it in a different way to touring because touring productions you you take it out every week or so so it's, it's put in slightly different um so yeah that and then uh tests everything sound checks tech periods with cast um which is running the show making sure everything works figuring out what you as a number two need to do um for the show to run smoothly so whether you need to 
check mics at a certain point, change mics, do anything that is required to make the show work. Um, and you do all that up until the end of the tech period and then open your night and then you're on your way. Um, so, yeah, that would be that as a number two. And then as an operator or a number one, you would uh, may or may not go to the prep centre to set up the show because you may go to rehearsals because if it's a new show or a show that you haven't done, you need to see what's going on. Um, so you would go to the rehearsals and mark up your script. So putting in points that you know certain things are going to happen, uh, sound effects, stuff like that, figure out what's needed, um, you with the designer. Um, and then you go to the venue, um, sound check or do the fit up with all that stuff like the sound with the sound number two. Um, and then tech, you're basically figuring out how you're going to mix the show. Yeah, and then same, do a tech period, and then uh, open the show. And it's always, yeah, hope for the best for the first few days, and then you get your head around it as it goes on. And yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that, that's quite a lot that you've got to get, you know, kind of get through there. Gosh, yeah. it must be quite, do, you, do you have to learn the script off Pat, or can you still have it there and just kind of refer to it, but you just need to know where everything kind of vaguely happens? Um, I personally learn shows with the script and then eventually get rid of it um because you just you learn the muscle memory of fader movements with dialogue and stuff like that with cast um and you, you just learn the show so in your head you know you read through the scripts but um but yeah so i'd normally start with the script and then take it away once you know what you're doing or general gist because the quicker you get with the script the quicker you stop um concentrating on the script and you start listening more so soon you can get rid of it the better it's kind of the same for the actors really um so then does that mean when you're kind of working with the actors as you say you're kind of getting a feel for when they're doing things does that mean that you have to kind of get to know them as well and know their their rhythms from a performance perspective yeah yeah so you um you learn what they're going to do most of the time. You get some people that you just can't predict. So you kind of do you, but there are certain people that you can be safe with and know roughly what they're going to do, how loud they're going to sing a certain bit. and Or say, you know, that someone's going to belt something coming up. You just be prepared for it so you don't burst everyone's eardrums. But um, yeah, I mean, you, you get, you learn, you definitely learn individuals and how they, how they're going to do their bits. That's very cool. I'd never thought of it in terms of you actually having to have that rapport and that real understanding of the script as well as well as well as the actors on stage. Actually, it's really interesting to kind of take it from that perspective. I'm sure a lot of our students will take a lot from that. Um, so then in terms of the sound department, if you like, um, what's the relationship like between you as number one or number two um, and the sound designer? Do you spend a lot of time with them and discuss things or is it very much here's what I've created go do it um it depends designer to designer but um you basically you'll normally have work with the designer through the build up to the show and opening and then once everything's up and running they will they'll step back and then it's you to look after and basically maintain what they designed what they wanted it to sound like um so with touring and stuff they won't it, they may occasionally pop in but the, most of the time you're left to it and you've just got to basically know what they'd like from the tech period and stuff and talking and discussing it um to then every time you take it to a different venue where it's going to sound different all these certain things you need to know how it sounded and how the designer wants it to sound so that when you go to the new venue it will stay consistent because otherwise you're taking a show to somewhere in the country they hear it like this and then another venue and it's completely different which is obviously not what the designer wants so um yeah so um, it's really interesting I've just never really thought of it in in those terms as to how that kind of fits together if you were um on a show and they put an understudy in for the night and they just totally out of the blue sang it completely differently how much would that impact what you're doing in the sound uh so it I mean that it's, it's kind of too expected you're never going to get uh, life for like stuff so uh, between understudies and then the, the original characters or whatever um so yeah it's kind of to be expected that they're gonna have slight variations or sing it slightly differently um it's just all about being on it so you can adjust 
as it goes but you you are very much doing it on the fly just trying to make it level out and sound fit sit nicely in the mix with everything else um but yeah it's just you just kind of have to go with it and see it's never going to be too far out it's just little things minor new changes you know that you just need to learn and you learn that with the understudies when they go on and stuff cool okay um, so then can you break down the roles in the department for us, you know, kind of from the mic runner to the designer? What's kind of the hierarchy and the way it works? Uh, OK, so, yeah, so most productions with musicals and stuff like that, you'll have a, an operator or sound number one uh, and then a sound number two. Um, and then other shows, depending on the scale, you can have more, you can have twos, threes and fours. Uh, just depends on how much is required. Um, so the number two's role will look, most of the time will just be to look after everything backstage. Um, so your operator can look after everything out front, um, but that varies job to job um, with how much uh, each person would do. But um, yeah, the main principle is number two will look after backstage. Uh, so that will be when you come in for the start of the evening, you would batch up all the radio mics um turn everything on in the pit and stuff like that or, and have everything ready to test um and then meanwhile the number one will be out front turning everything front of house on and testing everything front of house so testing all the pa uh testing all the sound effects and stuff like that work um and just loading desk files and having everything set up for the show and then you guys will then meet and uh do a sound check so you test everything um so that will be the number two talking to it into all the cast head mics um and then running around the pit testing all the band instruments and stuff like that uh and then also stuff like comms and cue lights um and yeah just anything for that particular show that's needed will get tested in sound check um and you normally do that uh about two and a half hours before or two hours before the show. So it gives you plenty of time to fix things um, before the show happens um, and all the cast come in and stuff like that. So you've got a uh, tech time before the cast come in for warm ups and stuff like that to fix stuff. So yeah, you do that. And then the number two would dish the cast mics out. So get them to their dressing rooms. Um, and then you waiting till the half um the number two would then depending on the show and the setup fit any mics that were required or go around and check the cast and putting them on themselves and they're getting put on in the right way or they're going on under wigs and stuff like that and the number the number one would uh open the house um and make sure everything's ready for the show and then at beginners go to their relevant positions so the operator would go out front and the number two go to the listening station and check all the mics work at the sound rack so you're listening to everything there to see it all works um and then you the number two would give clearance to the operator just saying that everything's working everything's good to go and then the operator would tell the dsm that we're happy ready to start and then once the stage is happy and everyone else is happy you would start the show that would all happen and then at the end of the show the operator would power down and the number two will collect the mics and that's the end of the day wow that, that's quite a hectic day for you guys it's, it's all right once you get into once you get into the hang of it so when you first start a show the rig checks and stuff will take a lot longer because you're like oh what else do i need to check and stuff like that but mm. a couple of weeks in you can do it really quickly bash through so kind of get into the swing of it yeah and then you do have a lot of spare time from then unless there's things to fix and stuff like that um or maintenance that you need doing but majority of the time you've you've got about for half an hour 40 minutes of sound check if that um and then you're free for a while until the show nice okay that sounds all right <laughs> so what what would you do if um mid-show something broke what what's kind of the panic stations a uh, kind of response to that or uh, does that happen i don't know yeah yeah uh, you do get um you do get problems i mean most of the time it's, it's smooth sailing and but you do have to be aware of the things that can happen and how to fix them because a lot of the time you have to do them really quickly especially when you're backstage 
So as a number two, um, when you're backstage and something goes wrong, most of the time it's the cast head mics, just because the, the cables and stuff like that, they normally break after a while just because they get pulled and all sorts, and especially in dancey shows, um, you'll have problems like mics sweating out, so cast will sweat, so obviously on their head, um, and the sweat will go into the capsule and then it affects the sound, the audio, um, the quality of the mic. So um, the number two will then have to go and fix these issues. So mic break, mic breakages and stuff like that is a case of quickly getting a mic and getting the old one off the cast member and the new one on. Um, and it's just about a large chunk of it is knowing the show. Because if you know the show, you will know how much time you have to fix the problem. It's often difficult if you come in as a dep or... Uh, it's a new show you don't always know how long you've got to resolve these issues so you may be like oh god i've got to spot this mic and, <laughs> but you may have like 10 15 minutes before that person goes back on stage um and they, is there ever a time when you have to kind of triage that if you like if you know that something's gone drastically wrong but someone doesn't have 10 minutes they've got like a quick change of, of one minute yeah uh there's this i've definitely had some tight ones before which, which is fun but at the time it's really stressful but it, it's uh a rush sometimes as well it's quite fun to fix when it goes right if you don't fix it in time then it's awkward but <laughs> uh, at the end of the day it's, it's live theatre and um, these kind of things happen so you just kind of you just have to do the best you can um, yeah. and resolve them a lot what we do a lot of the time so when you know there's not going to be many opportunities to fix problems the designer will allocate two mics to that person so if something does go wrong with their a mic we can swap it at the desk uh, to their b um their, so their backup um seamlessly so that's helps you out a lot especially when, you, when you've got cast members that they're they're on stage for a large chunk of time um yeah and then if, if they don't have that it is just a case of getting to them as quickly as possible and trying to resolve it um but you just gotta do the best you can have you ever had cause to kind of actually shut or stop the show to to sort out a problem um yeah occasionally um but the, i mean with mic breakages and stuff like that you just the show just keeps going if, especially when you've got multiple multiple people on stage you can kind of make it work from out front you can use other people's mics and stuff like that just to kind of get something out it depends on the room i mean if you're in a massive room with 2000 seats or whatever and and then that particular cast member, for whatever reason, doesn't project as much as some others do because they vary. Um, then there's not a lot you can do if 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 you can't be heard. But it depends on how much. I mean, say say you have you know most people you're only you're only going to be missing one or two lines, or they're not going to be as loud as they could be because you're using other people's mics to try and keep it audible. Um, it's more for if there's other technical problems that would result in. It's, it's, it's if it really is going to affect the show um then you'd look at stopping it but majority of the time you just kind of get through it and then it gets resolved but if for whatever reason it couldn't be resolved quickly then you may then speak to people about stopping or pausing the show and who would take that decision if that was the case i would talk to so i'd go into comms if i was operating i would speak to the dsm uh, the deputy stage manager who's or whoever's calling the show and just say look this is what's happening um we it depend but say for whatever situation um be like this may not sound good but we can fix it in as the show goes on or whatever i don't i don't really like to try and be the person that says oh i think we should stop because it's going to cause a lot of problems but if, if it has to happen it has to happen so um okay so then you've worked on touring productions kind of around the world and and in the west end so what's the difference between the two there's not, not a lot really it's it's um it's the same principles and stuff like that it's just when you set up for touring shows are done slightly differently with how they're set up so they're made so it can be moved whereas other shows that are static you put them in for into the venue for a year or two or whatever so you um so they put in just slightly differently little things but for the majority job wise and stuff like that what you require to do it's the same it's just you learn slightly different things touring um than you would 
staying in one venue just because you learn more about what you actually need to do to take all the equipment out and in to the venue each week. Cool. Okay. So then when you are actually on tour, um, where do you stay? Do you, do you kind of curl up in the back of the theatre or, <laughs> or do you have to find digs? Or? Uh, no, it's the same as, um, same as the actors. Uh, so I've basically over the years built up a list of digs and accommodation and stuff that I've stayed in or people have recommended. Um, so for most of the places now, I know at least one or two places that are pretty decent um, to... So it's either staying in a room in someone's house, uh, so like Airbnb or Theatre Digs Booker. Um, so you just book it on there and it's pretty simple. Or um, the Theatres of Digs list, well, they used to. I don't know if they still do anymore. Um, so uh, be renting flats or houses with a group of you that you're working with on tour, which is also a lot of fun. Or you could rent hotel rooms and stuff like that but it just depends on what you want to spend um so you can do it cheaply and then have more money to enjoy or save to the, when you get home or you can spend more on hotels and stuff like that and enjoy the tour but it just depends how you want to, to do it uh and then depending on the show when you move the show um you would so i've done shows where you could go on a tour bus so you do a load out um, but then because you're loading into the venue in the next place the next morning, you then get straight onto a tour bus, sleep on there and then get off in the morning um, and go straight to work. Uh, so that would be like your accommodation for that night between venues. Um, or when you're abroad, uh, most productions will put you up in hotels, um, which is nice um but it, you lose the option of cooking and stuff like that then but you gain a hotel breakfast and a nice hotel so it just depends on the production and the budget and what they want to do but most of it has been uh digs or uh rented flats or houses no oh, it's, it's it's all right it's it's um it's okay there's a few occasional shockers with the digs but you, <laughs> it just happens but most of the time it's fine everyone's really nice and the people that you're renting off they understand that you're not going to be around much i normally say when i turn up at digs i'm like hi uh, you're probably not going to see me for like four days and then when you see me it'll be for like half an hour um <laughs> just because i mean work for because we when we get to the venue we're in for the first two days most of the time until late and then yeah so you just pass like ships in the night and then you're gone (laughs) and sometimes that might be a little bit of a blessing rather than a curse how do you find working with the actors is it as much of a nightmare as we're all kind of led to believe it is or you know do you guys get on is it important for you to get on when you're on tour oh yeah definitely no you do you do get along with the majority of people um you work with and it's normally you know most of my tours you get really good groups and everyone's a laugh and you get to have some really good memories from it and stuff like that um and it is important especially as uh, a number well it's important for both sound number one and number two in different ways because number two you're interacting with the cast and all the crew a lot more um than the number one does um so it's really good to obviously get along with everyone understand how people work um in the cast and how different people are really um and then it's also equally important for the operator because your front of house mixing, you know, most of the shows, the number two will learn to mix and stuff like that. But majority of the time, your front of house, you don't get the social interactions with the cast as much as the number two does. So it's very important to try and be social with the cast as a number one because otherwise you're just this stranger that's out front that they never see. But you need to build that rapport and trust with them so then when there's problems and stuff like that you are able to talk to them and and they get it and stuff like that um whereas if you if you don't speak to them and it's all done through your number two i find it's a bit awkward and you never really get that connection with people and have you ever come across um times maybe when an actor has been quite unreceptive to you or difficult um when you're trying to work with them or anything that's kind of impacted you doing your job i guess occasionally yeah this is little things but you just got to kind of work around it um some people 
you know, so for example, if a num- you're a number two and something breaks, some people find that really inconvenient, you know, but you just got to reason with them and just get through it and just say, at the end, you need to, you've, you're there to do a job um, and fix stuff as a number two. And sometimes a cast member, like, oh, it's quite annoying that they've got to, you know, undress and get their mic pack out and take their mic off and stuff in the middle of the show. But it's either that or they won't be heard. And it's part of the, the number two's job is to, make stuff like that work um and most people most people understanding majority of people completely get it you know things go wrong it happens so uh yeah it's just about being positive and getting things to work <laughs> and again a, a very nice diplomatic answer there so from a production perspective then um as a sound engineer or an operator or anything um what is maybe the one thing that an actor could do to make your job easier Ooh. Uh, so consistency is probably the, the biggest thing or one of the bigger things is um, consistency just helps um, understanding, appreciating what other people are doing. Um, I guess could be another one. So just be aware of, just always be aware that, that, you know, of what every department is doing and they do for the cast. Sometimes occasionally you'll get people, they don't realise or they don't, care that you know someone someone in wardrobe has been in four hours before they have sewing yeah. their costume you know what I mean uh, yeah. or something stuff like that um yeah just genuinely being aware of what everyone's doing around you um because you're working in close quarters with a lot of people uh, especially when you're touring and stuff like that you you spend a lot of time with people so just being aware of what others are doing and appreciating it and stuff like that I guess is probably one of the best things to recommend I think that's a a very good recommendation thank you (laughs) um so then with that I guess uh training as an actor I don't know you know I I often found that I was told uh never annoy the technician never (laughs) annoy the guy that is doing the sound because if you annoy him he could one day just decide to turn off your microphone Um, (laughs) have you ever seen that happen (laughs) no I I haven't seen that happen no (laughs) There we go. We're you know busting out all these myths. <laughs> there you go. That that's that's one for the ages, I guess. It's always the question that I get asked the most is, do you know do people actually do that? It's interesting to to hear the answer. So then, how do you um do you work with the other areas of the production team as well? So you mentioned there, you know, the wardrobe designer has been in for four hours before, um and the lighting designer and the the lighting operator is there as well um do you have to interact with them quite a bit when you're doing the show yeah so um yeah you'll speak with wigs and wardrobe and stuff like that for things like how you want to make it work with the cast and their mics uh where you're going to put their packs where you want to put their mics because if they want to wear hats and stuff like that that's that's a big one with wardrobe is trying to make hats and shows work because um if you've got a cast with their with mics on the head um and then the wardrobe um department want to put hats on them that's going to affect the tone of the mics so you then have to work around the best way of resolving stuff like that whether it be changing the position of the mic or the position of the hat um so there's little teething stuff like that as the shows in the show's first few weeks and if you want to make any changes, you'll need to discuss with them and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of just being aware of what you want to do to make the show sound better and how that's going to affect other departments. Um, so there's just little, you just need to be aware of what everyone else is doing um, and think to ask others, you know, how's this going to affect you? Will this, can we do this without it mucking up certain things and stuff like that? Cool. I didn't kind of realise the extent to which you guys actually have to to work together in the space, I guess. I knew it kind of all fitted in together, but it's really interesting to hear you describe it in that way. So what would you say to kind of production students and sound students who are, you know, still developing their skills? What could they be doing at home at this time to, to kind of keep going? If you have any home studio stuff or recording equipment, if you want to do any sort of recording, um, making music and mixing stuff like that with your laptop, on your Mac, um, you can do that. You can uh, create anything really. You can just you still do sound designing stuff 
film and TV, grab a, some footage or whatever and start putting in post-production audio for that. So, yeah, there's, there's plenty of stuff you can do, online courses to just learn new things. Um, it's a couple actually that I'm looking at doing over the next few weeks just to keep me busy and learn something new that I can then take back and build on when I get back to work. Uh, yeah, so there's definitely there's definitely things you can do. Um, read. Cool. Thank you very much. That's kind of all the questions that I have for you today. So um, thank you very much, Tom, for coming on and talking to us about your industry. No worries. Mm-hmm.